Good afternoon and welcome to our neuroscience lecture series. I am Dr. Rogelio E. Ribas, Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. I will also be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eduardo Icaza. His presentation is titled, New Advancements in Low Back Pain, Intradisco Biologics. Dr. Eduardo Icaza is an anesthesiologist and comprehensive and interventional pain management physician at Baptist Health, Miami Neuroscience Institute. He holds double board certifications in anesthesiology and pain medicine and specializes in diagnosing and treating various acute and chronic pain conditions, including spinal neuropathic and post-surgical pain. Dr. Icasa earned his medical degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, during which time he earned the Robert Sweet Excellence in Anesthesiology Award. He completed an anesthesiology integrated residency at the same university, followed by a pain medicine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. Dr. Icasa is a member of the American Society of Regional Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, the Spine Intervention Society, and the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. Dr. Icasa joins Miami Neuroscience Institute from Mendelssohn Kornblum Orthopedic Spine and Pain Specialist, where he served as interventional pain physician, and he also consulted for various Detroit area hospitals. Please, let's give a warm welcome for Dr. Eduardo Icasa. Doctor? Thank you for the warm welcome, Dr. Ribas. Uh, allow me to just share my screen. All right, can you guys see the presentation okay, Dr. Ribas? Looking good, doctor. All right, so uh, thank you again. My name is uh, Eduardo Icaza and um, I'm an interventional uh, pain management physician here at the Miami uh, Neuroscience Institute. And I'm excited to talk to everyone today about uh, some new advancements in, in managing low back pain. We know this is a very common condition. Uh, we're gonna be talking today a little bit about intradiscal biologics. Um, and some of you might be wondering what exactly uh, does intradiscal biologics mean? You might not be sure exactly what it means and, and that's okay because it, it can mean different things to different people. Um, so we'll get to briefly talk about it. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have an interesting conversation. Um, I have no pertinent disclosures. Here's today's outline. So uh, I'm gonna talk about just a typical case example. Uh, like I said, this is a very common uh, uh, pain complaint and a very common uh, medical condition. Um, we'll talk a little bit about discogenic low back pain. We'll talk about different types of intradiscal therapies. And then what we're really gonna focus on is uh, micronized uh, disc injection treatment. So that's kind of the, um, some of the newer, where the one the advancements are, uh, are kind of being made. And uh, we'll go into that into some detail. So briefly, let's just talk about a common patient scenario. Uh, I see these patients every day in my clinic. Uh, I'm sure many of you see these patients in, uh, in your clinics as well. Uh, this is a typical, you know, 40 or 30 year old patient. Uh, oftentimes they have a, a physical job that can be a carpenter, uh, factory worker, maybe a gardener, um, but basically something that involves um, physical uh, activity uh, for the line of work. Uh, and they, they come in complaining of this low back pain. It's kind of difficult to differentiate. Uh, it tends to worsen with certain activities. They might have a couple of weeks where it gets pretty bad, then it calms down, then it gets bad again. Um, there's no red flags, there's no trauma history. Um, so this is a typical example of a, of a patient who, who might have this type of uh, pain complaints. So when we see these patients, uh, they can be kind of tough to treat for, um, for anybody, including myself. Uh, as obvious, uh, we obviously start off with standard treatments. You know, we'll start off with some anti-inflammatories, some muscle relaxers, um, Oftentimes we'll work with uh, getting them into physical therapy and making sure we get the core muscles uh, as strong as possible, making sure their uh, hips aren't locked up, making sure their hamstrings aren't too tight. 
Um, oftentimes, if the pain persists, so they're still having uh, ongoing complaints and limitations, then uh, they might come to me and we might talk about trying some injection-based options, uh, the most common being epidurals and facet injections. And for some patients, uh, this, uh, this combination of treatments helps a lot. Uh, they recover, uh, they get back to work, they get back to their normal activities, uh, and uh, they're happy, so we're happy. Uh, but there's certainly a, a population that uh, unfortunately does this not help, and they, they kind of live in this chronic pain cycle. Uh, and unfortunately, these eventually sometimes end up going to surgery. Uh, and I know this is not uh, an ideal scenario for a 40-year-old. Um, I know many surgeons don't like operating on 40-year-olds. You know, this is uh, sometimes a short-term fix because we start getting uh, issues with the adjacent segments. Um, obviously, it's a big surgery uh, in some cases, and this can lead to, um, you know, long recovery time and, and ongoing chronic pain issues in some cases as well. So let's go back to our patients and, and talk a little bit about the pathology and, and the anatomy. So this is the MRI for one of these standard patients. Um, overall, you look at my little arrow here, uh, it looks pretty uh, benign. We have nice, normal lordotic curvature. We have fairly well-maintained disc height spaces. There's no major disc herniations. There's nothing broken. There's no listhesis. Everything looks pretty good. Uh, the main thing that pops out here is that very bottom disc, that L5S1 disc. So if you look at that a little closer, you'll see it's, uh, it's a little bit darker than the other discs. So that tells me that it's lost some of its fluid. It also, it's a little flatter than the other discs. So it's lost a little bit of its height. There's a little bit of bulging, uh, nothing major, but it's, it's certainly bulging a little bit. Um, and you can tell maybe there's a little bit of inflammation uh, in that area as well. So uh, this is classic for what I would say a you know desiccated disc, and this is probably uh, causing pain. So discogenic pain, pain coming from the disc itself. Um, this is not pain from a pinched nerve. This is not pain uh, from a broken bone. This is pain from uh, that disc having uh, lost some of its shock absorbing capabilities. And so uh, the other thing I want to point out about this uh, in this MRI is uh, just giving you a sense of when I do with the typical injections, you know, what are we aiming for? Where are we going? So, um, you know, if you hear about facet injections, this little yellow arrow shows where we're targeting. So we're targeting those joints on the outside of the spine. When you hear about epidural injections, those go a little bit deeper, um, but, you know, in the epidural space, but we're not poking the disc, we're not really injecting the disc. So, um, so you can see if the, the pain is coming from the disc itself uh, and we're only doing injections in the area around the disc, uh, you can see why we don't always get success in, in treating these patients. You know, uh, some of our limitations or our toolbox is a little bit limited. Just to go over a little bit about, you know, discogenic low back pain. So uh, here in the U.S., it's very common. You know, it's estimated that we get about half a million uh, new cases every year. Again, the, the average age, these are, these are young patients. Oftentimes, they're in the prime of their life. They're, they're working. They're, they're trying to stay active. They're raising their families. Um, this isn't, you know, that's always grandma and grandpa um, type of uh, patients. Uh, and we do see an equal male to female ratio, uh, even though males tend to have more physical uh, jobs. Uh, females, you know, they, they do a very hard uh, job as well, oftentimes uh, carrying babies. So uh, we can see this sometimes uh, develop after uh, pregnancies. And again, the classic history, midline axial low back pain. So this is not pain that's causing uh, numbness, tingling uh, into the legs or into the buttocks. Um, oftentimes these patients, they're, they're not overweight. They're just average sized. Uh, like I said, usually no major trauma. Sometimes they might've had, um, you know, maybe a, a remote motor vehicle accident or something uh, along those lines. Uh, but again, um, usually atraumatic, um, smoking is a risk factor. So just something to, to be mindful of. We, um, the physical exam again, can be kind of, uh, difficult to pinpoint there. They might have some muscle spasms. Uh, but the classic uh, way to try to figure out is this pain from the disc is uh, it'll get worse when they're leaning forward. Uh, if they're doing any lifting, uh, any type of coughing or sneezing, anything that causes 
an increase in uh, pressure in the abdomen that kind of reflects into the, the spinal space that will aggravate their symptoms. Um, they're going to have negative straight leg raise, negative hip maneuvers, um, and uh, you know, really no pain with spine percussion. So I want to briefly just talk about uh, disc anatomy here. So let's take it back to you know our med school days. Uh, lumbar discs and all the discs, they're actually the, the largest avascular structure in the body. So uh, they're pretty simple, uh, but very important. Basically two components. You have the inner component, which is the nucleus pulposus. That's basically mostly water. So uh, 60 to 80% water. There are some uh, little bits of proteins in there to help us uh, retain the water. And there's some cells that help make those proteins that are hydrophilic and help kind of maintain the, the water uh, in the disc. Uh, and that's very important because that water acts like a shock absorber for the spine. It also gives us um, the ability for flexion and extension and that mobility that, that we need. The other part of the spine is the, the rings, the annulus. And those are just, you know, really tough collagen uh, circles. And that their job is to kind of, again, help support the spine and help us with the mobility uh, component. Um, but that's basically it. Those are the two components uh, of the discs. There's no blood vessels. Uh, that's basically what, what they are. Over time, you know, these discs do degenerate. They desiccate. So this is um, a picture of uh, what radiologists will sometimes use to grade uh, disc uh, desiccation and uh, degeneration. And I include this not because I want us to all be radiologists at the end of this presentation, but just to kind of show you the progression. So uh, grade one, you know, you have a very nice, healthy looking disc on the MRI. Um, that white is the, the fluid that we're talking about in the nucleus pulposum. So it's nice and healthy, lots of fluid. It's very plump. And then as you see, grade two, grade three, we start to lose some of that fluid. It starts to get a little darker and a little bit flatter. So this happens gradually for all of us uh, over time. It's a natural process. Uh, if you look on the right now, you'll see what happens as uh, you know, it tends to progress a bit more. So the discs get darker, flatter. We see more bulging. Um, and then grade eight, you know, that's pretty much um, paper thin uh, discs. Um, when we talk about discogenic pain, you know, it, there's no um, cutoff where I say, you know, grade three or grade eight, um, but usually it's, it's a dark disc on the MRI that um, will kind of be um, uh, a telltale sign like the one we saw earlier today. So the question is, you know, and this has been kind of a, a holy grail question is how can we regrow or regenerate these, these desiccated discs, you know? Uh, over time, you know, they're losing fluid, they're losing height, uh, and they can be a very common source of, uh, of pain. So, uh, like I said, this has been kind of something that we've been trying to develop treatments or a way to uh, help reverse some of this uh, natural aging. So this is where biologic therapies uh, come in. This is where the hope is, at least. Um, and there's gonna be three categories we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, stem cells, which is something uh, we all hear about. Uh, there's plasma-rich protein, which is also uh, fairly common. Uh, and then there's what we'll talk about on the last one, which is uh, cadaver allografts, or basically um, micronized disc. So first, let's talk a little bit about stem cells. Uh, stem cells, there's lots of variation uh, in what stem cell therapy is. Uh, and I would argue there's a lot of variation in the quality, um, in the sourcing of the stem cells, uh, and in the outcomes, at least in the, in the world of pain management. In my opinion, I think uh, stem cells are a little bit uh, still in the pipeline as a viable uh, treatment for discogenic low back pain. They're, they're not magic cells. You know, they, they need an extracellular matrix to really um, differentiates. Uh, I wish it was just as easy as let's inject some stem cells and they'll magically know what to do and, and regrow that disc or rehydrate that disc. Um, but it's really not uh, that simple. Um, and I know at least here in the United States, there's, there's concerns for lots of uh, cash pay clinics um, 
that uh, you know concern for fraud and maybe not doing the best uh, care for patients. So, um, so you know, if you look hard enough, you don't have to look very hard. You'll find clinics all over uh, the United States that are offering stem cell treatments. Um, but I think the the evidence is still really lacking with this treatment. The other uh, intradiscal biologic that you often may hear about, uh, or just biologic or regenerative medicine treatment that's very common is plasma-rich protein, so uh, PRP. Um, so just a brief reminder of what, what that is, uh, that's when we take the patient's blood, uh, we take it out, we centrifuge it, we spin it down, and we basically isolate uh, the platelet-rich plasma uh, portion of it. And this is where we have a lot of growth factors and a lot of um, other proteins that, that can help with um, uh, promoting a healing response. So the goal of PRP is uh, let's take kind of the healing properties of the blood, all the, um, the growth hormones um, to kind of uh, initiate a healthy immune response um, in uh, the target area. So uh, this is more commonly used for, let's say, rotator cuff pathology. Uh, maybe some mild knee arthritis, uh, bursitis in the hips. Um, so there's actually very good evidence uh, for uh, PRP in those locations. However, in the spine, there is not good evidence for this, uh, at least specifically in the discs. And, you know, the reason is because, uh, remember, the discs don't have any blood flow. So this is a, an avascular structure. So in my opinion, it makes no sense to be injecting uh, blood or blood derivatives into the disc because that, that's not really where there's blood flow. That's not really going to um, help us um, trying to, to cause an a positive inflammatory reaction. The disc uh, really, I think, just leads to more issues than uh, benefits. Um, and the studies that have tried this, there is actually a very high rate of infection. Um, so up to 25% in some studies. So in my opinion, this is, uh, this is, there's no real role for PRP in the discs. So the third option is, uh, micronized discs. So, uh, you know, as you all know, we, we are commonly using, uh, human donor cadaver tissue for lots of, um, uh, treatments currently. We use solid organ uh, transplants, heart, lung, kidney, liver, pancreas, bowel. Um, we use other parts of the human body as well. Uh, cornea, obviously we do blood transfusions. Bone grafts are very common. Uh, if you tear your ACL, sometimes the surgeons will talk to you about uh, using cadaver ACL versus um, you know, uh, other types of uh, natural tendons. So the question is, you know, can we source anything from the cadaver spine that might uh, be of use as we're helping uh, patients living and suffering with uh, chronic low back pain? And uh, I would answer that the, the uh, I would argue the answer is uh, yes, there is potential for that. So uh, this is a uh, an axial cut of a um, disc uh, of a cadaver. Uh, and the green is the staining of the nucleus pulposum that's been uh, determined to be healthy and viable. And so uh, what we're seeing is uh, an interest in basically extracting healthy uh, nucleus pulposum, so the viable cells, the proteoglycans, even some of the fluid uh, from these healthy discs. Um, we extract that, we basically uh, chop it up, clean it up, uh, micronize it, and then we use that to help supplement uh, the generated discs in, uh, in viable patients. So, so that's what the micronized disc or the cadaver allograft um, uh, disc injections is referring to. So basically taking healthy nucleus repulsums from cadavers, um, cleaning it, sterilizing it, and then injecting it into uh, um, a dark disc on a, on a living uh, patient having uh, low back pain. This is just a picture of what that looks like in the, in the real world. So this is under fluoroscopy. Um, you can see the needle going in from the uh, right side into that L4-5 disc. We basically put it right in the center in the nucleus pulposum, And then we uh, just carefully inject a little bit of that uh, micronized uh, disc uh, nucleus pulposum. We mix it with a little bit of saline before, uh, so that way it can actually get um, uh, easier to inject and kind of 
uh, give us some extra fluid. And so it's uh, it's a pretty routine, uh, simple uh, injection. And uh, uh, like I said, that's that's what it looks like. So it's a good idea in theory, uh, but obviously you want to see is there any data to to back this up. So that's uh, that's where uh, the money is. So uh, this is uh, a recent study, it's the VAST clinical trial. Um, it's an early study. Uh, the final study is going to come out later this year, uh, but I just want to briefly touch on it. Um, I'm excited to see what the final results are. But basically what uh, they've done is they took 215 patients with the discogenic pain that we talked about. Um, and, they, you know, they had MRIs and uh, basically determined they have uh, discogenic pain. Um, and they separated them into three groups. So we have group one, which is just regular standard treatments, medications, physical therapy, epidurals, facet injections, the, the stuff that we're normally doing, which may help some patients, but again, doesn't really attack the, the disc itself that's uh, lost its fluid. There's a second group where uh, it's called the saline uh, injection group. So they basically take just regular normal saline and they inject that into the disc itself. And then there's a third group where they take this micronized disc that we talked about uh, that's been extracted from healthy cadavers, and then they inject that into that uh, dark disc. And so what we're looking at here is the seeing, is there improvement in pain? And is there improvement in function? Specifically, you know, the um, disability uh, index that we use a lot in pain. Um, and we're looking at to see, uh, are these outcomes or is there any improvement over an extended period of time? So we look at six, 12, 24, and 30, uh, 36 months. So the data I'm about to share is just for the initial 24 patients. So like I said, the, the, the bigger study, the whole 215 patients, it's going to be coming out later this year, probably, uh, in the summer, early fall. Um, but basically, the, the summary uh, results here, uh, the initial 24 patients, the patients who had the, uh, the micronized disc uh, injection showed improvement in pain, so decrease in pain and improvement in function, so they could do more of their day-to-day -day activities with less uh, pain and limitations. What I found especially interesting is, uh, A, it's sustained, so meaning these results were uh, still present at 12 months but also uh, repeat MRIs uh, showed that some of those dark discs had actually kind of gotten a little more fluid, a little more plump. Um, so that's uh, encouraging. I'll just briefly go over this graph. This is from that initial uh, study. So this is just looking at pain. So pain here uh, on the, the tall axis here, and then the, the low axis is just months and uh, time. So looking at the blue line first, that's the active allograft. So that is, again, the cadaver disc that's been chopped up and sourced and cleaned up and then injected into that dark disc of that patient who's having uh, low back pain. So um, you can see that uh, the blue dots and the blue line, basically after the injection, the pain went down pretty much within a month or so, and it continued to trend down over 12 months. So that's um, obviously very encouraging. The red line, that's placebo. So that was the saline injection. And uh, this is also interesting because you can see that the saline group also got a lot better. Uh, and you might ask, well, how could that be? Um, well, the, the saline is a fluid. So even though it's a placebo, you're injecting fluid into that dark disc. So in a sense, you are rehydrating that disc a little bit. So I suspect you are seeing a little bit of that, uh, that shock absorbing capability return to that disc. So I, I suspect that's why you see some of that initial improvement. Um, the question marks in that graph is because they had some of those patients uh, fall off before the 12 months. So they're not quite sure where, where it would land, but, uh, but there was initial improvement uh, with the saline group. The green line, that's conservative therapy. So that's the medications, the therapy, the epidural injections, et cetera. Um, so you can see they weren't really getting any better. Uh, and then at three months, they were allowed to cross over. And so uh, when they did cross over and they got uh, in, an injection with the micronized disc, uh, they also seemed to have a positive response, meaning a 
marked decrease in their pain score, and that seemed to be sustained uh, at least to the 12 month mark. So, um, so this is encouraging from uh, decreasing a uh, low back pain uh, type of treatment. Looking at the disability function. So this is the West Street Disability Index. It's a common um, uh, objective metric we use in pain management to see, you know, how are you walking? How are you standing? Um, and uh, similar to uh, the pain score. So again, looking at the blue line, the blue line is the, uh, the micronized disc injection. Those patients, uh, after getting injection about, you know, when they follow up in a month later, they had uh, a lower disability score, meaning they had better function, less disability. And that remains sustained over the 12 month uh, follow-up period. The red line, again, that's the saline injection. So that's the saline injection into that uh, dark disc. Uh, had a similar response again, um, a little bit lower score and uh, the disability score. And that seems to hold true through the whole, the whole 12 month follow-up period. Um, so again, that tells me that saline, even though it's a placebo, um, you are injecting fluid, you are rehydrating that disc to a degree. And then the green line, again, that's conservative. So that's just medications, therapy. None of those patients were getting any better until the three-month mark when they were offered the, the treatments. And when they did, they once again had a significant decrease uh, in their uh, disability score. So they had improvement in their function. Um, you know, within a couple months, and that seems to be sustained uh, throughout the 12 month period. So, um, so those two uh, pain and function scores seem to be trending in the right direction. This is the uh, just an example picture of what I was mentioning earlier of uh, the MRI before and after. So, uh, on the left, you'll see uh, again L5S1 disc that we talked about. It's it's dark. It's desiccated. Uh, there's a little bit of bulging. Um, everything else in that MRI looks, uh, looks all right. Um, so after the injection, six months later, you can see that their, uh, their pain score went down. You can see their disability, uh, index, uh, went down. And I would argue it even looks like there's a little more white fluid, a little less darkness in that disc. Um, and the report mentioned that the disc, uh, bulge had even regressed a little bit. So, um, so that's obviously very, uh, encouraging and, and for me, very, very exciting just to have um, something that could potentially be another tool in our toolbox. So just some, some other things to consider. So what are some of the complications, some of the negatives, some of the considerations? Um, you know, intradiscal injections uh, in general have a high risk for infection. Um, you know, it's avascular structure. So even if a little bit of bacteria gets in there, um, it can definitely have um, uh, room to grow, and that can be a very uh, difficult complication to treat. There's also concern about um, intradiscal injections that you can destabilize that outer annulus. So remember now that little outer part uh, of the collagen fibers? Anytime you disrupt that via, via injection or surgery, um, you could potentially destabilize that fragile disc. So, um, so this is not something that doesn't carry any uh, potential adverse side effects is just something we have to uh, weigh uh, pros and con, uh, pros and cons on. There is a theoretical concern for allograft cross reactivity. So just like you can't give the wrong blood to um, the uh, the patients, um, in theory, you know there could be uh, some cross reactivity um, if you gave a cadaver bone that doesn't quite agree with uh, the particular patient. So, um, to my knowledge that we have not seen that because, um, uh, again, it's avascular structure. We're injecting mostly, uh, proteoglycans and, um, saline and a couple cells, but it, it is a theoretical concern, um, that needs to be, uh, thoroughly looked at. The other thing is, uh, we know low back pain is complicated. You know, sometimes it's not just the disc. Um, there can be muscle pain, facet pain. Maybe the patient doesn't like their job. Maybe they have secondary gain issues. Maybe there's some underlying depression. So um, I'm not going to say that this one injection is going to fix everything. Um, I understand it's, you know, pain can be a multifaceted problem. Um, so that's something we also we have to kind of keep in mind. And like I said, uh, the data I just briefly touched upon, 
um, was uh, just the initial uh, 24 patients. So um, I'll be excited to see what the full study shows and what ongoing studies will show uh, of this therapy um, and see, you know, is there a statistical significance? Um, you know, do we see sustained relief longer than 12 months? Um, are there any significant complications? Um, so these are all things that um, remain to be uh, fully evaluated, but, um, but I think there is promise in it. So in summary, uh, discogenic pain is a very common source of uh, disability uh, and low back pain. Uh, again, this is a, the classic patient for this is, you know, our younger 30, 40 year old uh, patient with just uh, axial low back pain. Oftentimes they'll have that uh, one or two dark discs on the MRI, uh, but no significant disc herniation, no significant, you know, radicular pain, no, no weakness, no uh, paresthesias, just just annoying, difficult to really uh, treat uh, low back pain. Right now, we have limited treatment options for these desiccated discs, um, but I, I'm excited about the future of uh, intradisco biologics, um, specifically the micronized disc. You know, I think, um, you know, in a sense, why try to recreate what nature has given us? You know, with you know, with stem cell therapy. You know, everyone's trying to regrow this, regrow that. If we can safely source it um, from uh, healthy cadavers, um, I think it's going to be a very uh, exciting and a very uh, game-changing treatment that we can offer our patients um, here in the near future. Here are some references for anybody who uh, wants some additional reading. Um, and with that, I, I welcome any, any questions, um, uh, comments, and, uh, and conversation. Thank you, doctor. That was, uh, it was uh, very uh, stimulating as far as all the, uh, the information and, and the, like the, what everybody tries to throw at, you know, maybe this, maybe that, you know, it, you talked about the cellular matrix or differentiation of the cells um, for stem cells. We're just, we're not there yet. If you had to take a guess, how many years would it probably take to get there? Uh, if, if we ever do, right? If we ever do, yeah. I think that's a, that's a good question. You know, um, Obviously, I think st stem cells are working for like bone marrow transplants and uh, in our, our cancer world. So I think that definitely is uh, potential. I don't think it's a, a lost cause, um, but I think uh, I'd say probably at least five years or so until um, we have... Um, you know, a stem cell and a uh, growth factor or a differentiating factor that we could, you know, w work in conjunction to say, you grow into bone, you grow into um, cartilage, uh, et cetera. We have a question. Uh, and the question is asked, they're asked, um, question is, what about the technique to inject the micronized disc material? Is there is there multiple techniques? Uh, is there one that's that's uh, across the board? Everybody uh, tends to follow that technique. I guess that's the question. Yeah. So um, that technique is basically just a a sterile uh, intradiscal injection. So. Um, and so uh, usually it's recommended we treat it almost like a surgery. So it's done in a sterile procedure room. Oftentimes these patients will get some antibiotics uh, before the injection. Um, and then we try to, uh, the, the good way to do it is a needle over needle, meaning so we use a big needle to kind of make the initial poke and then a smaller needle inside um, that goes into the disc itself. Um, and again, the reason is we're trying to minimize infection because um, anytime we disrupt the disc, um, uh, you know, and, and we don't want to introduce anything in there that could potentially lead to infections because those can be very difficult to treat and, uh, and they can be disastrous if it's not, uh, treated properly. So I, I would say it's a standard injection, you know, not too, um, dissimilar to discograms. So we might be, remember we used to do a lot of discograms, uh, before surgeries that's fallen out of favor now, but it's the similar technique. Well, we thank uh, Dr. Koleslar from that from Trinidad uh, for that question. And uh, we have the next question uh, that is, uh, I was about to ask you this question too. You, you touched upon antigenic reactions or immune reactions. 
but supposedly, uh, according to the study so far, there has been few, right? And is there a way to prevent it? Like do you, you said about giving antibiotics before, is there anything to do with steroids before? How do you, how do you, how do you bridge that? Uh, and you, you mean for infections, trying to minimize infections? No, rea antigenic, uh, the reactions or immune reactions. Oh, I see. Yeah. So to my knowledge, I, I, I don't see anything on the, the initial study um, claiming that, but um, you know, I think that that's something that needs to be thoroughly uh, looked into. Um, I know that the, the, the cadaver disc, when they do extract it, they obviously make sure the cadavers um, had appropriate uh, screening in terms of they don't have syphilis or HIV or any hepatitis C or any type of um, potential virus. Um, the, the disc material is also kind of sterilely washed with uh, vancomycin and uh, I think erythromycin. So they, they do um, sterilely process it with that. Um, again, more for the sterility aspect. Um, as far as the antigen, again, there's not very many cells that are uh, in the nucleus opposum. So uh, I think the theoretical risk is low, but it is there, so. Well, I think uh, that was a question from uh, anesthesiologist at Bayview uh, Barbados. Dr. Waterman, thank you so much for that question. Um, and you, you talked about uh, the PRP being better for maybe our other articulations. Uh, due to uh, them being more vascularized. Um, but the question is, after you do this injection, is there a, a sense of fullness, kind of like when you inject the knee and, and you have that sensation of fullness? Do you feel the same thing in the spine is the question. Yeah, so, you know, the first couple of days after any disc injection, it's not uncommon. They feel a little worse before they feel better. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, discograms have fallen out of favor because uh, patients hated them. Uh, doctors hated doing them. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the surgeons work, don't get that much helpful information out of them. Um, so, uh, but yes, uh, oftentimes it's, they, they will feel uh, a lot of discomfort in the low back for at least the first couple of days. Um, oftentimes we would give them uh, muscle relaxers to take the day of the procedure and maybe for a couple of days following the procedure. Um, but, um, you know, little low back pain is to be uh, expected. Uh, sometimes a little aggravation for a couple of days. Obviously you want to make sure there's no red flag symptoms. And the, the, uh, the saline, uh, when you're basically rehydrating uh, the disc, um, any time period that's known as to if it ever gets reabsorbed or it goes away, how long, how long have you seen that last or the study show once you do uh, introduce it? You know, that, that's a, a good question. You know, and it's something I've thought about as well. You know, if, uh, if the saline is so helpful, that's, that's a lot cheaper than sourcing cadaver material um, and processing it. And, you know, this worried about infection. Uh, if we can just use sterile saline, we all have that. Um, so, you know, I'll be curious to see what's the long-term track record in, uh, in the final study and some of the other ongoing studies uh, looking at this type of treatment. Um, but yeah, you know, it'd be funny if that would be, uh, not funny, but it'd be um, yeah. ideal if that would end up being a very uh, useful treatment that we could get covered. Yeah, we ran a mile to get to the same place. Yeah. <laughs> so, um Talk to me a little bit about, you're part of a team at the Miami Neuroscience Institute. Talk to me about the team approach. Uh, we come from back in the days when I trained, you know, you had one doctor calling all the shots and everything else. But now, you know, that whole, um, the, the idea of an institute of having neurologists, neurosurgeons, uh, anesthesia, pain, and all that, the team approach, how does that benefit the patient? Yeah, so a uh, great question. You know, uh, um, that's part of the reason why I, I, uh, I came down here was to try to work more in conjunction with a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, we work in the same hallway as all these uh, uh, specialists, and obviously we're in the same chart. We're, we're constantly communicating with each other, um, and uh, we uh, constantly are re-educating each other too. So we hold grand rounds uh, and do regular case discussions uh, as a group 
amongst ourselves. Um, so we're we're always pushing ourselves to the next level. And the nice thing about the team approach is like any team, you know, you're going to have some strengths and some weaknesses. Everybody does. Um, and you're going to know who is a go-to person on your team that might be better suited to, to help us figure out what's going on uh, when you don't, when you don't know. Research, right? The piece we were missing uh, at Baptist, right? Until Dr. McDermott and, and, and your team, right? Um, talk to me a little. It's so cool seeing that, you know, I don't know how many, MNI now has over 100 and something, 160 research uh, papers that are out right now or studies and, and so how that evolves, but the importance of being able to be the ones doing the research. Can you touch that, that topic? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, obviously uh, there's a lot of improvements um, left to be seen in, in medicine. We got to keep moving the bar. And, um, you know, having the resources, the, the both from a, a staff, uh, financial support um, and uh, time um, is necessary. So you need to have all those ingredients in order to have a successful um, support system for research. And uh, our chairman, Dr. McDermott, uh, knows this from his experience and he's, he's um, uh, building it and fostering it. Physical therapy is something that sometimes in our other countries is is not as, maybe not as, high functional uh, as what we might uh, try to accomplish over here. Any ideas on to, you know, the, the physical therapy specifically for spine care, um, how to establish it or how to start something that might help folks from ground zero, uh, physical therapy wise, what are you looking for or what is that therapist? Uh, because sometimes you can hurt somebody more than you can help somebody, right? And so how to, how to do that if you're in a, you know, somewhere where it, it doesn't exist yet and you want to build a team and you want to do it, your recommendation is to approach for that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I do see that from time to time where we get patients from uh, overseas that, um, they admit, you know, there's not just, a, there's not a lot of uh, specialized physical therapy for things like pelvic floor pain or SI joint pain um, or manual therapies. Um, and even here in you know Miami, you kind of have to know who is the therapist that has expertise in, in some of these um, uh, areas. Um, as far as developing that, you know, I think it comes back to some a a teamwork approach. So uh, making sure you're communicating with the therapist what you think is going on, uh, what the pathology is. So sometimes it's a little more uh, nuanced, just saying. Um, you know, low back pain. You might have to say, look, this patient has facet pain um, with, um, you know, some arthritic changes there. So I really want us to focus on uh, strengthening the core in that area. And, you know, uh, maybe some of the others, um, making sure that the hip isn't um, too tight and causing extra strain on those muscles. So having that communication is important. Um, I also know some therapists, uh, both here and in my uh, prior institution, that they uh, would go to these special uh, conferences uh, in person and get extra training, extra hands-on training. So um, I think that's a great tool to really uh, connect with experts in the, the therapy world um, and, um, and learn from them and, and hands-on. There's even some intensive uh, two- or three-week programs where you can go and um, almost get like a crash course and if you want to specialize in um, pelvic pain or SI joint pain. We have an observership program also at Baptist Health International where observers can come. And so they can all, if at any time they wanted to uh, spend a little time with you, I'm sure you would be okay if they would come and have an observer from many, any of these countries that are joining us today. But it's another way that we can try to help out. Um, one of the questions uh, that was just on the chat is the cost. It, obviously, it's very hard for us to see. We don't carry around the charge master under our elbows, right? But that, you know, have you seen traditionally that the micronized uh, material that that is a costly uh, procedure or or not so costly? Yeah, so that that's a, a very good question. Um, one of the companies that I know that is uh, sourcing this. Um, they do a lot of cadaver sourcing for, you know, ACLs, bone material, uh, skin, corneas. Um, I asked them before this presentation, just what's the sit, what's the sticker price? Uh, just, just, I'm curious. Cause again, I, I deal with patients. I don't deal with, 
you know, insurances and things, but they said it's about $6,000. So it, it's not cheap. Um, granted, you know, there's a newer therapy. It's still investigational. Um, like anything, I think um, uh, with time and, um, you know, more evidence and maybe some more um, companies and suppliers, um, hopefully A, we'll see that it's uh, quality treatment, but B, we'll see the costs come down. Um, and to be fair, you know, 6,000 sounds like a lot, but when, um, you know, I also think about it in the grand scheme of things, you know, um, here in the U.S., MRIs are very expensive too. You know, an MRI can cost easily 15 to 2,000, uh, sorry, $1,500 to $2,000. Um, physical therapy, uh, time off of work, um, you know, epidural injections, that, that all adds up too. So, um, so while it is expensive, you know, healthcare in the U.S. is um, extremely expensive, but I, I think there, um, that is something we obviously we have to weigh in. And international insurances won't cover it. So it'll have to be out of pocket self pay. But at the end of the day, I, I agree with you, you know, paying for something that's going to continue to do the same thing or saving that money and maybe investing into something, uh, that might give you a different outcome and yeah. might help you out. Yeah. And to be fair, you know, th this is still an investigational uh, treatment there. The, um, they need, um, at least from the FDA standpoint in the U.S., um, some more level one trials. That initial study that I showed uh, is kind of one of the um, trials that's been uh, promised, uh, been promising. But um, it's this is not so this is approved by Medicare. So Medicare is approving this. Um, however, most of our patients in Medicare are older, right? They're 65 and older. So that's not your typical uh, discogenic low back pain patient that we talked about. So uh, the hope is as we get more evidence and uh, more studies that we'll see this um, be approved for, uh, for everybody. Well, I think doctor, we got to the end of the questions and uh, I wanna uh, take advantage of, you know, on behalf of Baptist Health International, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Icaza for this informative uh, presentation and all of today's participants for your attendance. If you have any additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to us at bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We will make sure to get those questions over to Dr. Icaza so that he can answer them appropriately and, and pass it on. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next neuroscience uh, lecture series scheduled for Wednesday, July 26th. We thank you very much again for your attendance and have a great afternoon. Thank you, doctor. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.